most of the problems, uh, except uh, sometimes you still uh, uh, kind of um, not so sure about how to use the correct mathematical language to state some statement. This might be a problem for you. And uh, well, this is also something, uh, well, at the end of this course, I would like you to, to know how to write a rigorous proof and uh, how to write the rigorous statement uh, when you try to state something or prove something. Okay, this would be important in the future. Uh, and uh, uh, another thing is, uh, you may notice, you may also notice uh, the exam for, well, the homework for this week is, uh, uh, well, it might be harder than the homework before. And this is normal, well, because uh, uh, I really feel that you guys are doing well. So uh, based on the feedback from the midterm and the homework, so I would like to, in the, well, in the last few weeks, I would like to make this course slightly harder, uh, slightly more interesting, so that uh, you'll feel uh, a bit more interesting about, uh, well, algebra, okay? Uh, and, uh, well, if you, if you think it's over too hard, then, well, let me know, okay? And also, that, mean, that also means in your final, it will be slightly harder than the midterm. Okay. Uh, oh no. Well, it, it should be fine. Yeah, you can see that this midterm is not so hard. Uh, and uh, uh, another thing is yes. And uh, well, although I, I trust you guys, but I, in the midterm, when I was greeting, uh, I still find some mistake. Uh, well, you guys are making. Uh, well, some of you are making uh, so similar to each other. So you know, uh, I hope that's, uh, uh, that's just a coincidence and uh, not mean anything. Uh, but well, uh, if, if, that doesn't, if that does mean anything, well, please, please, well, don't do that, okay? Uh, well, you think the ODE is harder than abstract algebra? Well, you see, this is the reason why I think this course is, uh, is over too easy for you. It's supposed to be much harder, well, not much harder, but harder than ODE course. Otherwise, uh, it's either your ODE course is over too complicated, too hard, or this uh, well, abstract algebra course is not hard enough. Um, so we'll see, okay? We'll see how you will feel. Uh, after like um, until the final weeks, okay? Uh, well, hopefully we are going, we will have some real meat for you, even some extra meat for you, okay? Uh, well, it depends on time. If we are doing well in this week and next week, then we may, we may be able to mention some uh, really, complicated stuff for you guys, like the free groups, like, uh, uh, well, the free groups or the silo groups theory, okay? Those kind of things. Those are really, well, this uh, makes uh, makes the abstract algebra much harder than, than most, of, most of the math course, okay? Uh, and also, uh, I will, since our textbook is, uh, is kind of, uh, uh, easy, so I will try to mix some other stuff from my previous con well previous text. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, well, I will try now to make it to 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 Olympic style. Okay, because that's something I don't think that makes sense uh, for a college student. Uh, well, it will be not over too technical or not over too hard to imagine why you get this kind of solution and so on, okay? So let's start today. We will mention more about, uh, well, this kind of uh, group stuff, theoretical group stuff, okay? Today, we may not see a lot of examples because this kind of things, uh, for this kind of thing, um, seeing more examples may not help, 
in some sense. Okay, so today we will face two more theory. Uh, well, first, let me remind you what we have learned last time. Uh, we have a very important idea about group when we try to study the structure of groups. Uh, that is the substructure of groups, which is subgroup. Okay, we're trying to learn some structures. This is, uh, well, this might be always the first thing you have to try to study which is as long as you have a structure, then how would you get when you try to mention some substructure or restrict the structure on some subset of your original set, okay? And uh, we define that what is a subgroup, right? What is a subgroup when we define last time? Well, we see that what is a subgroup? First, you have a group. Then you can study where well, you can say something about the subset. Okay. Then a subgroup means first something as a subset. And it, it itself have some substructure, some group structure. H is a subset plus H has a group structure. Then we say that H is a subgroup of G. And uh, by the way, uh, later we will use this notation to denote H is a subgroup of, of G, which is H is less than G. Okay, this simply means G is a group and H is a subgroup. Okay, and uh, well, H is a group. This is not so easy to test. And that means, well, if you want to check some sets to be a subgroup, you only need to say that, okay, the multiplication operation or the operation on your group, uh, well, it is closed on this H and for every element on this H, it must contain this element's inverse. Plus it also contains the identity element. Right? Three things you need to check if you want to check something as a subgroup or a group. First, the multiplication must be the uh, well, must be closed, must be a closed operation. And second, this multiplication for any element uh, will well, it has an identity. And the third, it has a, for any element, it has an uh, inverse element. Okay, so which means multiplication is closed, inverse operation is closed, and uh, you you have the identity. Uh, but it's a little bit too hard for us to check, well, whether this is a, whether this is a, whether this is a subgroup or not, uh, by the way. So, well, when you try to check this is a group, uh, there's a remark I would like to mention that is uh, the identity of subgroup is the same as the group, okay? So anybody can, anybody can tell me why this must be true? So I just mentioned that H is a subset plus H is a group. That means H is a subgroup. But a natural conclusion is then, well, the identity of such subgroup, it must be the same as a whole group. Why is that? Oh, because if we have, suppose, an identity at H and it's different than at G, mm -hmm. we, uh, we would have kind of like two identities for the elements of well, the, our, in, the A, in the G. Well, mm -hmm. but, but the problem is now, this identity on H, well, it may not be the identity of G, right? Maybe it just uh, it just uh, keep everything on H doesn't change, right? Is well, that possible? Well, but like, say if, for example, like uh, A is some kind of element of H, but A is also in G, right? And mm -hmm. so what we're getting is that uh, if 
I H is an in like identity of H and I G is identity of G. When we apply mm -hmm. it to A, we both get A. And so basically when we multiply that by inverse of A, we get yes. that I H is equals to I G. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think you get the idea. So although we say that okay, uh, well it may not be the same, but uh, uh, basically, it has to be unique. And uh, as we mentioned before, it is a unique, it is a unique solution to this equation. Okay, so we can use this kind of rule to test that identity must be the identity for the whole group. Because it satisfies this equation and the solution to this equation is unique, it's identity. And uh, another proposition is, well, although you have to check, well, from definition, you have to check this uh, subset is a subgroup, then it must uh, itself form subgroup. But we have some, well, easy way, a shortcut in order to check whether H is a subgroup or not. Suppose H is a subset of G, G is a group. Okay, and then H is a subgroup if and only if A, B inverse belongs to H for any A, B in H. Okay, this, uh, well, this is an easy way or a shortcut in order to check whether an H is a subgroup or not. You don't need to check one, two, three, three steps for the, for the group. You, know, you just need to check this one kind of element belongs to H, okay? But we have to check it for all combinations of A and B. Exactly, exactly. But uh, sometimes it makes life easier, or at least it makes your proof shorter. We will see that very soon. Okay, uh, well, let me first approve it uh, before we see any example. Because that example, I will introduce another concept. Okay, so let's prove it. Let's say, well, since this is an if and only if statement, so you have to prove it by two sides. Well, for the if part, well, if, uh, for the only if part, so which means if H is a subgroup, then of course, well, for any AB in H, we must have AB inverse in H. So check, right? Because H is a subgroup, that means for any AB in H, B inverse is also in H. So that means a times B inverse is also in H, which is why we have this statement is, uh, well, this side is true. Otherwise, if H satisfy any AB in H, AB inverse in H, we want to show that H is a subgroup. How can we show H is a subgroup? How can we show, show a, H is a subgroup? What shall we show if we want to prove something is a subgroup? Hmm? Well, we have to show that multiplication addition is closed. Mm -hmm. The operation is closed, that's correct. But is that all? Oh, and inverse operation is closed and such. Inverse operation is closed, is that all? Addition? Uh, there's no addition. Oh, wait, wait, wait. yeah, sorry. We have one operation. Hmm? Association. Association is fine, we but I, 
Mm, the association is automatically true because uh, it's just uh, the same as the same operation as in the G, right? The so, identity. Mm, what's that? The identity. You have identity, right? There's three conditions for a group, right? First, you must have this uh, operation is closed. Second, you have the operation's identity. And third, you have the operation's inverse, right? So three statements about checking one thing is a group or not. So how can we check that? First, we need to say that the identity is in H, right? How can we show that? Well, that's not so hard. We choose B equals to A, right? Then A times A inverse belongs to H for any A in H. That means E is in H, okay? Uh, by the way, I think I forgot to mention that H is not equals to empty. H cannot be an empty set, okay? Otherwise, uh, it also satisfies this kind of well condition, but it's not a subgroup. We cannot say that H is a subgroup if H is not, if, if H is an empty set, okay? So we check the first thing, the identity is on H, is in H. And uh, we also need to check, okay, uh, well, the inverse operation and multiplication operations are both closed in H, right? So first, uh, let's say, well, for any A, B in H, we want to show A times B is in H, right? We want to show A times B in H. That means, uh, well, the multiplication operation is closed. This is also not easy, well, not hard to say because we know that, well, uh, A is in H, B is in H, then, well, A, B is in H. Is that okay? Uh, seems slightly uh, weird for us, right? Since A is in H, B is in H, then how could we, based on this condition, based on this condition, how could we say A times B is also in H? Hmm? Oh, oh, can we take uh, like A equals to identity and B just mm -hmm. being B? And mm -hmm. then we get that B inverse would be in the group. Yes. And so it's probably second step is for where we need to show that every inverse element are in this group, right? And then when we take A and B inverse, we get that mm -hmm. A, B is in the group. Great. So let's say, okay, the second step is better to show that for any element in this H, we have the inverse is also in H. Okay, so we take A equals to E, B is just a B, and uh, then, well, B inverse is in H. So which means this, uh, well, this H is closed under this inverse operation. And the third, we can show that, okay, for any A, B in H, we have B inverse is also in H, right? So that simply means, well, A times B inverse inverse is in H based on our condition. So that means A times B is in H. H is closed on this multiplication operation. Okay, so you can see that when you're trying to prove something again, you have to assume nothing and uh, just use a condition we gave you. Okay, so that's the end of the proof. This is how you show that, okay, something is a subgroup. It's very easy, you, need, you only need to check for any element on this uh, subgroup subset, A, well, this en one element times the inverse of another element belongs to this, uh, well, this subset. Okay, any question?
No. Okay, then let's well let's go to something new. That is, uh, since we are trying to study groups, as we mentioned before, what is a group? Well, group is just a something that it has a group structure, right? So you want to find well study the group structure. When you try to study the group structure, you study the substructure. You also need to find okay some kind of map that keeps the group structure. Then you can see okay what kind of structure you can see for a whole thing. Well, you can what you can see for a subset. You can use some other you can use some other model to study this uh, this group structure other than this uh, original model. Okay, so this is so-called the group homomorphism and isomorphism. Okay, it's almost the same as the ring homomorphism. That is some map that keeps up the operation. Okay, so first let me define what is a group homomorphism. Let's say G and uh, G prime B groups. A function or a map phi from G to G prime is called a group homomorphism. By the way, so when we try to when we say something is a group or something is a group homomorphism, well, if the set you study has more than one operations, for instance, if it is a ring, then you must tell me what kind of under what kind of operation it is a group, okay? Under what kind of operation you have a group homomorphism. This is very important, and uh, otherwise it will make me really confused if you say that something is a groove, but you mean it is a ring and uh, it is a groove and plus operation, okay? It's called a group homomorphism if phi a b is equals to phi a times phi b, okay? For any a, b in g. So multiplication on G is the same as it maps to the multiplication on G prime. Okay, and uh, there are more well fancy terms here. If we have G prime equals to G, then well you have a homomorphism from a group to itself, okay? Then a homomorphism phi is called an endomorphism. If your image is, uh, is G, okay? And also we know that, well, as we mentioned before, like the ring isomorphism, if G, well, if uh, a homomorphism is a bijection, then we call it a uh, isomorphism. Isomorphism simply says that, okay, well, this, uh, there's two groups, G and G prime, they have the exactly same structure as a group, okay? They have the same algebraic structure. Moreover, if you have not only G, well, not only G and G prime are isomorphic to each other, but G and G prime are the same, if you have a bijective endomorphism, it's called, well, an automorphism.
Oh, this might be a little bit weird because that means you you find that the group structure of a set is the same as a group structure of a set, and uh, these two are the same. Well, it may not be usual. Well, at this moment, it may not be usual to see uh, why we have to study a bijective uh, isomorphism from a group to itself. But sometimes you may see that the group structure of a set. Uh, it may only have some kind of uh, some particular, some particular well type by itself, a group structure or the algebraic structure of a set. But then you must uh, be able to study oh, for different kind of group structure on this set. They are actually the same, okay? For different kind of a uh, group structure on a single set it might be the same inventory. And uh, by the way, so this, uh, this is something, the automorphism of, uh, of a group, sometimes um, it has a name, sometimes we call it automorphism of group. Okay, the bijective uh, homomorphism from a group to itself. And, so like, uh, oh, sorry, can I ask a question? So like, Say for example, if I take a group and I just map like A to A inverse, like mm -hmm. all the time, do I get mm -hmm. a bijective endomorphism? Mm -hmm. That is a very good example. So if you have, you map from A to A inverse, is phi a homomorphism? If it is, then it seems that it is a bijective endomorphism. Well, my question is, well, is that, is that a homomorphism for sure? It's not. Why is not? Because CAB is B inverse A inverse, but CACB is A inverse B inverse. Exactly, right? So if you try to map this uh, phi a b inverse is what? It's phi a b inverse. It should be this, right? Uh, so that means, well, for if you try to map this, uh, well, phi uh, a b inverse, it should be a b. But meanwhile, phi a inverse b inverse, well, phi a b inverse must be phi A inverse B inverse, if it is a homomorphism, then it should be phi A inverse times phi B inverse. Okay, then that's fine. That's also A B. Uh, but, but be careful. This is actually not your phi A B inverse, right? If this is actually phi A will be A inverse. Right. Uh, so which sorry. we cannot really mm -hmm. see like uh down. Yeah, can you shift it? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me, let me write something. Maybe I didn't write it very clear. So this means V A B inverse. Well, if that is a homomorphism. Then phi a b inverse should able should equals to a b. But if it is a homomorphism, phi a b inverse is equals to phi b inverse a inverse. All right? But this equals to phi b inverse times phi a inverse. So this is equals to phi b, well, b times a. So this, this map from A to A inverse, it might be a homomorphism. It might be an automorphism only if G is a billion. Okay, 
If G is a billion, then you max A to A inverse. Well, it is an homomorphism. It is actually an automorphism. Okay. But instead, there are some other examples that might tell you, okay, what is an automorphism? For instance, what if uh, we map from C, well, let's say uh, multiplication, multiplication on C, or even addition on C, uh, both are fine from, from the non-zero element on C to the non-zero element on C, or from C to C, such that phi maps Z to Z bar. Okay, to the complex conjugate. This is an automorphism from C to itself. Right? Uh, okay. So this is basically, well, what we're trying to study, uh, well, in the, in the later this course. The, if you want to study the structure of groups, what you have to face to would be the homomorphism and the isomorphism. If the image, if the image of your homomorphism or isomorphism is a group itself or is a subgroup of your G, then well, maybe sometimes we it may help us. It will not hurt us, but it may help us because there are a lot of study, a lot of literature about this kind of uh, automorphism, well, the old automorphism of, of G, of a group. This is something you may see in the future, okay? So before we move on, let's, uh, let's study some kind of uh, propositions. Some propositions about this, uh, well, isomorphism and homomorphism of a group. Uh, first, if you have, well, an isomorphism or a homomorphism, you have G, well, G has an identity and the G prime also have an identity. Just like the ring homomorphism, just like what you have proved before, this E must be maps to E prime, okay? A group homomorphism must map from an identity to identity. It cannot map to something else, okay? And secondly, well, if, well, we have that if you take this markation AB here, you can split it well into phi A times phi B. And of course, if you take the inverse, you take inverse as an operation. This is a single element operation. It can also compose, it commutes with this homomorphism. Okay, for any A in G. Just as a ring homomorphism. It's exactly the same. The proof is pretty easy. And the third, the real image, VG means, uh, well, the image of phi, well, it means uh, all the set B, such that B is equals to phi A for some A in G, okay? Is itself, a subset, subgroup of G prime. Again, this is like a ring, right? So the ring homomorphism image is a subring. And uh, fourth, the kernel of phi. What is a kernel of phi? It's a pre-image of the identity element, right? It's actually, well, all the B such that V B equals to E prime. B in G such that V B is in is equals to E prime. 
or we can write it as V inverse E prime. Okay, it's also a subgroup of G. And meanwhile, V is one, two, one, if and only if kernel of V is equals to this identity on G. You have nothing more on this kernel. Okay. So any question about this propositions about the homomorphism? By the way, this uh, automorphism and endomorphism, they are kind of confused, but don't forget, well, just like rings, eventually what we are interested are homomorphism and isomorphism, okay? This endomorphism and automorphism are not so important in this course. It is important in the future study, like in geometry. So, I hope you guys can prove this proposition yourself, okay? Let me ask you, let me ask you how you can prove this proposition. How can we show that this uh, a group homomorphism maps identity to identity? How can we show that? Oh, wait, wait. if we take, if we take, say, uh, phi of A multiplied by phi of identity, mm -hmm. then we get phi of A, and this happens for any A, Mm -hmm. uh, and the same we can do for the right, in, like kind of like right multiplication. Right multiplication, yes, and, that's right. And so basically, yes. we just prove it by definition. Exactly, we just prove by definition. That's easy enough, right? Or uh, we can prove by definition. We can also prove by our, our old trick, right? E square equals to E. That means V E square equals to V E. That means V E square equals to V E. Then, well, V E must be the identity. Right? Both works. How about the second one? Well, maybe the second one is over too easy, right? Because uh, phi A inverse times phi A is equals to phi E is equals to E prime. So that means because you can break these operations and make it inside. So that means, okay, uh, you have phi A inverse is equals to phi A inverse. Second one is very easy. You don't need to, add, to do any tricks. How about the third one? How you can show that this VG is a subgroup? Well, we have an identity. We have like inverses because we already showed how to obtain any yes, inverse. Yes. And we always have like closed multiplication because yes. if we just take V of A multiplied by V of B, it's just V of A multiplied by B. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's totally correct. Well, so if we can get it, uh, but of course we can also, well, let me just write it as obvious, okay? Uh, and also we can also use, this as an example to use our proposition state before, this one, right? You can also say that for any AB on this phi G, for any AB on this phi G, well, this uh, A, B inverse is belongs to this VG as well. 
Okay, this is another just a week, just another week. And uh, how about the fourth one, the last one? How can we show that this kernel of phi is actually a subgroup? Well, we have uh, that. Wait, do we we all have an identity for it, right? Why, why, well, so why don't we have any identity on the kernel? Oh, wait, sorry, kernel is not, yeah, I forgot. That kernel, kernel is, is maps to, well, it's uh, identity to identity instead of zero to zero, right? It's identity to identity. So oh, identity okay. is more or less like zero in a group, right? Okay, then we have an identity and mm -hmm. <coughs> we always can, basically, if we have something being in the kernel, then it's inverse should be in the kernel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, uh, and yeah, and then basically when we multiply anything by themselves, when we, like F, if F A multiplied by F B, and both of them are kind of identities, we just get an identity. So yes. <clears throat> A B is also in kernel. Yes, that's right. Again, you can check it by, well, well, this uh, definition of groups. And now we have to also need to say that, well, this, uh, this phi is one, to, uh, is one to one if and only if this kernel is only identity, right? If P is one to one. Then of course we must have the kernel of phi is identity, right? Because phi of E is identity. And if you have any other element on this kernel of phi, then you have two element maps both to E prime. So this is not a one to one map. Right? Now if kernel of phi is equals to E, you only have one element. We want to show that V is a one to one. Why is that? Then that means, okay, V A equals to V B implies V A V B inverse is equals to, well, this E prime, right? So that means V A B inverse is E prime. So since we know that the kernel is only identity, A B inverse is E. A equals to B. It's identity. Well, it's, uh, it's identity, so A equals to B, so that means, well, one, two, same value gives you the same variable. This is a meaning of one to one. Okay. This seems not to be so hard, right? The homomorphism is almost the same as uh, what we did for the for the ring homomorphism. The group homomorphism at this moment is almost the same as the ring homomorphism. And uh, well, we even have more this kind of proposition about isomorphs. Let's uh, discuss a little bit more about isomorphism. Then you will see the group homomorphism is still the same as the ring homomorphism, but sometimes it can even will be more useful than the ring homomorphism. So suppose you have V from G to G prime is an isomorphism. Or if, if it is, well, if, if you don't want, then you can also say that, okay, V of course from G to G prime is a homomorphism. And then suppose 
G is at one to one, it means the kernel of G, uh, the kernel of V is, uh, is only identity. Then V is actually, uh, well, an isomorphism from G to the image or VG, right? The image of V. But whatever, as long as you have an isomorphism, then what we have is if G is a finite group. In on rings, a finite ring is not so interesting for us, right? A finite ring, it may always be something like ZP or ZN, right? It is interesting, but it's not so interesting because if it is a ZP or ZN, we already know almost everything on it. At least we know how many elements on it, right? But now, if we try to study groups, then how many elements on this group sometimes may be a little bit tricky. If G is a finite group, then so is G prime. And moreover, G's, well, the order of G, which is the element, the number of element of G is equals to the element of the, the, well, the number of element of G prime, if you have an isomorphism, okay? Of course, this is true because uh, an isomorphism simply means some bijection, right? Uh, well, you have a bijection, then of course, it's a one on one to one corresponding, then that means, okay, the element number of element of this two set are the same. And second, for any A in G, the order, well, you study the order, but sometimes uh, you also define the order of an element, right? The order of A equals the order of V. Okay, so which means, well, not only this uh, isomorphism will not only keep the number of groups, it will also keep the order. It will not only keep the order of groups, it will also keep the order of elements. And the third, if G is a beating, then G prime is a beating. Okay. Why is that? I think the proof of this proposition is also not so hard. You guys are able to prove it by yourself. How can we prove? Well, first one is uh, obvious. And uh, Second one, why second one is true? Sorry, just order of an element is like how many times you have to multiply to itself before it becomes identity? Yes, but it must be the smallest one, right? Oh, okay. okay. The order of element is uh, it's the same as the order of the cyclic group generated by this element. You still remember what's a cyclic group generated by one element? It's e, a to the power zero, a to the power one, a to the power two, and so on, right? A multiply by itself, and uh, if, well, any times. And the order is, the order of this element is the order of the cyclic group. So how can we prove two? Well, we know that identity is mapped to identity. So mm -hmm. whenever one of them reaches identity, means another also reaches an identity. Mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. And also we must have, okay, if, uh, if you have this a to the power n is equal to e, then that means phi a to the power n is equal to e prime, right? 
But be careful when you try to check this, you also need to check this n, this order of a, is the smallest number such that a to the power n equals three. So which means for any number is less than n, a to the power k shouldn't equals to e, right? So if you want to say that phi a has order n, then you must say that phi a to the power k is not equals to e prime. Of course, if phi a to the power k equals to e prime, that means a phi a to the power k, phi a to the power k equals to e prime, so that means a to the power k equals to e because it's phi is an isomorphism. Right? So the second one is also easy, but you have to check. Don't forget to check. And the third one, well, is also easy because it's a bijection. So for any element and another element, well, you can switch the order of multiplication. If uh, you can switch the order of multiplication on G. Okay? This is not so hard to see. Uh, well, so let's see another example. For instance, let's try to study this, uh, well, all the non-zero element of the complex numbers. with uh, with operation, well, as multiplication, okay? This is uh, the multiplication groups of complex numbers. Then let's say phi is from the C cross or C, well, C, well, C cross maps to S, which is, well, what is S? S is basically the, well, the circle, the circle on complex plane. This circle on the complex plane, it itself also form a group. And- oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you please uh, explain again, how do we define this phi? This phi, we, we, we haven't defined yet. We haven't defined yet, don't worry. So we try to map everything but zero, which is a punch, the complex plan, to this S, which is a circle, okay? And uh, this circle, it has an algebraic structure automatically by multiplication. Two elements on a circle multiplied together is still on the circle. Then we define phi z to be z divided by the normals. Every point, we compress it, and it becomes a point on a circle, okay? Then this is a homomorphism. I think that's clear, that. Is that clear that it is a homomorphism? Wait, so we're taking any point on the complex plane, which is not zero, trying to map it to its kind of like it's image. It's kind of like the, the Yeah, cosine theta, i, c, i sine theta, right? We try oh. to map this kind of number to, well, measure the length of this, uh, this element. Then, can you see that this is actually a homomorphism? Well, it is not a ring homomorphism for sure, because S has no ring structure. The circle does not have any ring structure. You cannot do addition on it. But this is a very good example of a group homomorphism. Because if you have X times Y, V X times Y is equals to X times Y over X times Y's norm. 
And uh, of course, it's equals to x over x norm times y over y norm. So which means this is a homomorphism from C punched, well, C cross punched, uh, punched complex plan to a circle. Okay. My question is now then, what is a kernel of phi? What is a kernel of phi? Oh, so kernel of phi is just like any the real number. right part of OX. Yeah, like mm -hmm. any real number, but positive. Positive real number. Yes, don't forget, positive real number. So that it can map this number to one. It must be plus one. Okay. And uh, another example is well, as a homomorphism, another example would be the determinant from GLNF to F, well, without, without zero. You see the general linear groups to F, F without zero. Okay. This is a, this is an unto map. Mm -hmm. Well, which is for sure. Sorry, I'm I'm really sorry, but can anybody remind me what is a general linear group? Uh okay. General linear groups, general linear groups is all the invertible matrix. Okay. We'll use that again and again in the future. GL and F is N by N matrix and uh, which are invertible. N by N matrices, which are invertible. Okay. And as coefficients, they use the elements of F? Yes. The coefficients and the entries, the entries are in F. Oh, okay. Thank you a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that this is a homomorphism because determinant of AB is equals to the determinant of A times determinant of B. Okay. And uh, another example, as we mentioned when we try to study the ring homomorphism, is uh, the trace operation. Right, the trace operation from again say G L and F to well now is slightly different, right? Is to F with some um, well let's say F with a uh, plus operation, and uh, this G L and F is also with plus operation as a group operation. Okay, if you take the trees of a group, A plus B, then it will be trees of A plus trees of B. So if you try to treat this G, L, and F with a plus operation as a group, then the trees operation is a group homomorphism. From this uh, matrix group to this F. What is a trace operation? I hope everybody remembers this. The trace operation is very simple. It's just uh, you use all this, uh, well, this uh, well, diagonal element, you add them up. That becomes a trace of the well, of a matrix. Okay. Any question? And uh, another example of uh, homomorphism or isomorphism is if G is a cyclic group of uh, order N, if G is cyclic of order N, then what we can say is G is actually 
isomorphic to Z. Okay. This uh, this notation still means uh, G is isomorphic to Z. But now G is a group, so this would be a group isomorphic to Z. These are not uh, well. Be careful. Uh, well, our notation will kind of abuse of notation, but uh, as long as I mention this is a group, then this is a group isomorphism, isomorphic to this uh, this group. If I say G is a ring, then this uh, isomorphic notation must be the ring isomorphic. Okay. If uh, G is a group, then G is uh, isomorphic to Z. Why is that? Why a cyclic group is always uh, isomorphic to Z? Oh, well, it has a same number of elements. Mm -hmm. And the the kind of like identity, sorry, this like we came up one mm -hmm. to another, mm -hmm. and like the multiplication is obviously like closed because we only have powers of this like element. Okay, but when we try to say something is isomorphic to another thing, the only thing is uh. Um, yes, you can see that the structure should be the same, but the only thing I want you to say is how can you construct the isomorphism between them? If you want to say two things are isomorphic to each other, two groups are isomorphic to each other, then you have to say how you can construct the isomorphism, right? By the way, the statement I made here is not so clear, right? Because this ZN is actually a ring, not a group. So if I try to say this, um, well, as this as a group, then I have to say what kind of what kind of operation, which uh, which operation form this uh, makes this a group, right? And then under this operation, G is the uh, same as this uh, Z. So what operations I should choose if I want to say G, a cyclic group, is the same as Z? Multiplication. Multiplication. So you want to say that Zn multiplication. So that means G is uh, is uh, isomorphic to Zn with multiplication. Sorry, uh, that should be addition. Yes, it should be addition. All right. This will make life much easier. Why is this? Well, why G is isomorphic to Zn with operation addition? Why G is uh, well, it's the same, it has the same structure as Zn as a group under addition. Why is that? Because n times any element of Zn is zero. Yeah, n times any element is zero, but uh, well, what does that mean? Again, because if we kind of sum the same element to itself n times, we get mm -hmm. an identity or zero. Mm -hmm. Then how can we say these two guys have the same structure? I understand what you're saying. Yes, uh, if you take, if you read anything, then you to the power n, then you basically to get zero. Uh, so it seems that the n is uh, is the same. But then how can we construct the isomorphs? From G to the n. Oh, you take a generator of the group G and you map it mm -hmm. to one. And mm -hmm. then basically, uh, because it's a cyclic group, then we just get that everything else kind of maps like. Yes, that's right. You can take this, uh, well, A to the power to, to, to the power one to one or A to the power K to K, right? Then you can say that this is actually an isomorphism. Or you can take phi k bar equals to a to the power k. Right? Either this one or this one. Uh, depends on well, whether you want to take phi from g to zn. 
or for this one is phi from dn to g. Okay, it depends on which which side you want to choose. And you can see that you can show that this is a bijective homomorphism. Okay, which is why these two guys are basically the same. And Zn with addition is actually a very important example for group. You may find in the future a lot of lot of groups can be reduced as Z. Okay. Any question? So if we have some kind of homomorphism from one group to another group under say mm -hmm. addition, and then we have a homomorphism from the same two groups under multiplication. Well, we be careful, be careful. When you have a group, you only have one operation, right? When you change your operation, you have a different group. Remember, group is a set plus an operation. If you change any of them, then you change your group. This is very important. Okay, so this, this is why sometimes we have to make it clear for what kind of operation you are discussing. You can see that Zn with plus is totally different from Zn, well, minus zero with multiplication. These two are totally different groups. Now, which means a group, a group, it contains two parts, both set, but set is not so important. Multiplication or this operation is more important than a set. This is different from a ring, okay? This is absolutely different from a ring, which is very important. Okay? So any other question? Aya, yeah. do you have any other question? Uh, not really, thank you. Mm -hmm. So be careful, be careful. Uh, when you're trying to study groups, you have to forget everything, uh, well, every other structure of a set, okay? You have to concentrate on one operation structure, one algebraic structure. This is totally different from a ring. Which is why sometimes uh, in, in a lot of contexts, they always introduce a group first so that you will not get confused. Okay. Any other question? If no more questions, then let's have a short break. And uh, well, let's break for five minutes, well, 10 minutes, and uh, we'll resume at 19, okay? And I will also pause this uh, record. Okay, so uh, I start recording now. Uh, okay, so. Last course, well, last class, we mentioned how to identify a group, how to study the structure of group by isomorphism, by homomorphism, by subgroup, and so on. Okay, now let's try to do something real. Let's try to really study, well, try to see why the group structure is sometimes hard to study. Let me first try to uh, we'll mention something and prove something so that you are able to use as a very powerful tool and uh, which is something I also mentioned on your meter, okay? This is so-called the Lagrange theorem or Lagrange lemma. But before that, I have to mention what is so-called the coset and uh, 
Let's soak out the love yarns. Sir. Okay. Uh, this is a very important thing. This is very important and very basic thing about uh, well, how Guru can help us and how you can use Guru to do something like counting, counting the numbers and uh, counting something like uh, doing number theory. Okay. So if H is a subset of G, then let A any A in G, we can define the following C, which is you use an element to do the right, well, to do the left multiplication of a set, which means you use this element to multiply anything on this set. This is so called Uh, left coset of H. Of course, since we have this left coset of H, we also have the right coset of H. But in context, we always use the left multiplication as left coset, which uh, sometimes makes life easier. And uh, they are equ well, they are actually equivalent. But uh, we well, we just use the left one. Okay. Wait, uh, are cosets ideals? That's a very good point. So this can be seen as some kind of uh, mimic or some, some analog, um, analog of uh, ideal, okay? But you cannot really see it as an ideal because when we're trying to see something as an ideal, then um, they're basically saying that whatever, you can you can use an element to multiply it no matter right left uh, no matter left multiplication or right multiplication and uh, an ideal means okay this guy is actually itself it's actually h itself but now this cannot be really seen as an ideal stuff instead it should be seen as some kind of uh, equivalent class if g is a billion then sometimes we write it as a plus h. Now you see this a h, a times h. It's not really like an ideal. If h is an ideal, then this a times h is actually h itself, right? It's not trying to uh, be an analog of that kind of thing. Instead, we try to be an analog of this kind of equivalent class. Okay, let me show you an example. Okay, so let's say G is actually our symmetric group of the or triangle of this uh, equilibrium triangle and uh, one, two, three. Okay, the symmetric group of this guy. Then we see that this H, which formed by identity and uh, this uh, reflection over or the reflection upon this, uh, well, this vertex or this line, you do the mirror symmetric about this line so that it makes a one, two, three to be one, three, two, right? This F. This form a group, form a subgroup, right? Because if you have the, well, this uh, mirror symmetric, this uh, reflection on this, uh, on this, on this axis, then you do it again, it go back. So which means F square equals to identity. So this itself form a group. Form a, it's, a, it's actually a subgroup of G, right? Then let's try to see what kind of coset it is. Well, it has, okay? First, the identity times H, which is H, is a coset of H. 
Okay. It is a I the reflection. Second, if you use R times H, where R is again, you try to rotate this triangle counterclockwisely by 120 degree, right? Then it change from one, two, three, two, three, one, two. Okay, then you can use this R multiplied by H, which will give you, okay, R, R times I is R, R times F. And by the way, R times F is actually equals to F3, which is you take the mirror symmetry about the axis starting from the third the third vertex, I'm sorry, third vertex from this. Okay, you can see. Okay. And also, this R, the counterclockwisely rotation, um, it has R, it has R square, right? You can also use R square times H then the set becomes r squared, right? And r squared times f, which you go, well, you do the mirror symmetric, you do the mirror symmetric and you counterclockwisely will rotate twice and it's actually equals to f2, which is you rotate among this one, okay? So this is also equals to uh, this equals to f h. This equals to f three h. This one equals to well f two h. So you may see that the coset of a set of a subgroup, it is something uh, looks like totally random, right? First. And uh, the most important thing is the coset is not, again, a, a subgroup, right? It has no identity. It is just a something that contains some element. And uh, moreover, it may not have the correct representative element, right? Remember, as I mentioned before, this kind of thing is the analog of a equivalent class modulus the equivalent class modulus an ideal on ring right so of course if you try to take the equivalent class on an ideal or modulus an ideal then of course this uh, representative element might be different right for the same equivalent class so in some sense you can try to imagine this cool set it's just like a translation. It's just like a translation of a subgroup. Or if it is an ideal, then it's just a translation of this ideal. Okay. And uh, another example. Another example of uh, this kind of, uh, well, coset stuff is that real proposition. If you have a homomorphism between two groups from G to G prime, then what we can say is phi will be is in the image of uh, of uh, of this uh, of this uh, of this homomorphism. Say B equals to phi A. Then what we can say is the inverse of B as a set. Remember, what's the inverse acting on an element or acting on a set? It just uh, gives you another set, right? The inverse of a map, well, that simply means it could be one element, it could be a set of elements. And uh, this can be written as a coset of kernel is equals to A times kernel of, 
okay? So, which means, well, you try to, this is more or less like you try to find, you know, what is a image, well, the pre-image of zero or identity. Then you try to find the inverse of some other element. What you need to do is you just change this kernel a little bit by translating it a little bit. Okay. Or some other word is more or less like uh, you have a linear map. You have a linear map, then this linear map maps a lot of things to zero. Then, of course, if you want to find the image or the pre image of some, well, you map a lot of things to zero or identity. Then, if you want to find the pre image of A, this is A. You want to find the pre image of A. It's just like this pre image or any pre image of A. Uh, let's say pre image of B. Then that's just like any pre image of B. Like you have an A here. V A equals to B. Then you make this guy, which is a kernel, to move a little bit. so that it becomes somewhere here. Okay, then you get the pre-image of B instead of zero. So again, the cool set is like a translation of a subgroup. How to prove this proposition? Well, the proof is actually trivial. Wait, can okay. you repeat again your statement? The coset is what? The coset is basically like the translation of the curve of a group, of a subgroup. Okay, you see, at the very beginning, this guy is basically the kernel of V. Okay, so which means if you take the inverse of zero, you get this set. And if you, other than this zero or identity, you want to push back this B. How can you push back this B? Well, you find one A here. Then you're trying to draw the similar neighborhood, which is you move this neighborhood center at A. Then what you get is the pre-image of B. This is just the intuition. Okay, and here you can see that you try to change, you try to translate, or you try to translate this uh, kernel phi by multiply A. If it is a billion group, that simply means you try to add A to your kernel phi. Okay, A plus kernel phi, something like that. So, how to prove it? Can you prove it? Can you prove it for me? This is not so hard. Why the pre-image of B is equals to A times kernel of B? Um, assume LM, assume like C is an element in the kernel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then C A C C A C C and it's C A because C C is identity. Right? This is what you mean, right? Yeah. So which means okay, if uh, if uh, well B is in V G and uh, B is in V A then C times A is also B. So which means C times A, well, A times C, I'm sorry, is a left multiplication. A times C is also in this, uh, 
So that means, okay, A times kernel phi is a subset of B inverse B. You need one more step. Right? You also want to say that V inverse B is also a subset of A kernel phi. Of course, any element on kernel, if you translate A by multiply C, if you try to change A by multiply C, then you get back to where it's still on the V inverse B. But you have to say, okay, for anything on this phi inverse B, it's also in this A times kernel phi. How can you see that? Wait, but doesn't it just follow because we can, because we know that phi AC equals to B, thus like the pre image of B would be. AC or? Well, we don't really know that, right? Oh, because we're not sure it's one to one? Well, it's, it's, it may not be one to one. In most of the case, if I state it like this, then the kernel will, will not be trivial, right? The only problem is you want to say this V inverse B, right? This, this state, well, this part you prove. This part of prove is. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. Mm -hmm. you, you can say B equals to phi A, and then you can say that for any element and only for the elements of kernel, you have phi uh, of A multiplied by some T, where T is an element of kernel. So, yeah. Yeah, but that's still saying that for any C, you pick up from kernel, right? A C is also on this phi inverse. That simply just says that any element on A times kernel phi is in the element, it's in the set phi inverse B, but not the other way. Right? This is a logic. Now you need another way. You need phi inverse B is actually a subset of A kernel phi. How can you show that? Oh, we can we can pick like any random T, say that. Yes is in the pre-image of B. And mm -hmm. then basically we can just show that uh, phi of T is equals to phi of A. And uh, that mm -hmm. would mean that, uh, uh, guys, help. That means we had an idea and I forgot it. <laughs> well, that's almost done, right? Phi of T is equals to phi of A, right? So that means, okay, that means what? That means if you try to, the only thing you want to say is T is in this phi inverse B. It must be in this A times kernel phi, right? So you want to write T as A times something on the kernel. How can you write it like that? Oh, oh, oh we can write uh, phi T equals to uh, phi A multiplied by phi uh, um, a inverse multiplied by t, and then we get that phi a inverse multiplied by t is an identity, and- Yes, or on the other word, you can, re well, you can reverse this term, you can multiply the inverse of this term, and what you will get is phi a inverse t is equal to identity. Now, uh, let's say this is identity E prime because it's in G prime. That means a inverse T is in the kernel. Oops, sorry. So T equals to A times A inverse T is in a times the kernel. Right? This is very interesting. You see? That means 
you try to take off this A part, the rest, the rest of this T are in the curve. Okay. You try to take off this representative element, then the rest must be on this curve. So on the other word, on the other word, this kind of way to check whether something is on your coset or not, it's very useful. And it use a kind of property like or some kind of language as the equivalent relation. Well, corresponding to a set, uh, a subset, a subgroup, we can define the coset, but we can also define the equivalent relation. We can define the equivalent relation. Well, let's say it's a left relation, left, uh, left coset of relation. A is uh, equivalent to B if A inverse B in H. This is actually an equivalent relation. Okay, and the equivalent well question you can check by yourself why this is, why it is uh, an equivalent relation. And the equivalent class, of this, uh, this one, of this equivalent relation, are uh, the cosets corresponding to H. Okay, you can see it very clear here. So this relation in the ideal, in modulus and ideal, is quite obvious, right? This relation, well, if you try to see H as an ideal on the ring theory, then that simply means B minus A belongs to this ideal. Then they are in the same, well, relation. They are in the same equivalent class. But here you have to be careful because on a group, you don't really have this uh, addition to be, well, uh, commutative. So which means sometimes it will, you have to write it not as a subtraction, but as a division, A inverse times B. And you should also be careful about the order, whether it's A inverse B or B inverse A, or A, B inverse, this kind of thing. They are different, okay, on a group, which is why when you're trying to study this kind of equivalent class stuff or the coset stuff, it's slightly more complicated than ring. Okay. However, the good thing is, well, sometimes a group is really much, much simpler than a ring. For instance, sometimes well, or maybe in most of the, the case that we will face to, we are interested about the group with only finite element. So if, uh, well, G uh, is finite group. If G is finite group, we will assume well, it always at least in today's class and uh, in most of the case in the future this semester. Okay, let's assume G is a finite group, then 
what we will have is when you try to study g to be finite, then this kind of coset stuff and divide one group into uh, several equivalent classes, uh, equivalent classes method, it can help you by, well, by help you to do some counting. The first important thing about the coset is, as you may see from this example, when you try to multiply something to a set, then the good thing is, then it doesn't change the number of elements of this set. Okay, this is very good. And uh, which means when you try to see this kind of uh, equivalent relation, it can divide all the groups, the whole groups into different equivalent classes. And uh, on each equivalent classes, it has, the group has a same amount of element. The, well, the coset has the same amount of element. This is a group, then based on this uh, coset to be an equivalent class, equivalent relation, it uh, divides the whole group into several pieces. Each piece is a, an equivalent class or an coset. Okay, this is H, this is AH, this is BH, and so on. The good thing is then each classes have the same amount of element. Okay. Since we didn't prove that it is an equivalent class, so I have to still need to say that two cosets have no non empty intersection if and only if they are identical, which means any two cosets has no joint element. You cannot have a joint element between two sets. Okay, this is very important. Let me prove it because I don't want to prove this is actually an equivalent relation. So I will prove this one as a substitution. Okay. Any question before I move on? If no, let's prove it. Okay. Well, but let's then we get the number of elements in the G are is divisible by H? Exactly. This is what we used in the midterm, right? This is very important, and this is so-called, uh, this is actually a corollary to so-called the Lagrange theory. It's actually, well, basically it's a Lagrange theory. You find it, okay? So let me prove this. Suppose you have a joint element for AH and BH, okay? Then that means there exist H and H prime in H such that C is equals to AH is equals to BH prime. All right? So what does that mean? That means AH is equals to BH prime. So A is equals to BH prime H inverse, be careful. We multiply H inverse both sides so that we can move it here, not here. It's not, it may not be an abelian group, okay? So you see that this guy is actually in BH. A is in BH. So that means if you use A times any element on H, 
it's still in BH, right? Because you use A times another H double prime, it still, it still can be written as B times H prime and H inverse H double prime. It's still in BH. So you have AH is a subset of BH. Similarly, BH is a subset of AH, that means AH equals to B. Okay, so that's, that proves that it's actually all these kind of equivalent classes. Before we prove it is an equivalent relation, all these kind of equivalent classes or all these kind of cosets are disjoint. So it divides the whole G into different classes. Hello. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I'm sorry. Hello, hello. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, so we have we have this kind of thing, and as Anya mentioned, we well, we then have so-called the Lagrange theorem. Uh, before that, let me introduce a notation. Before that, let me introduce a notation. Uh, let's say the index. of H in G is the number of distinct cosets of H in G, which is the equivalent classes, the number of equivalent classes. How many equivalent classes do you have, okay? Denoted as G H. Okay, then the Lagrange theorem is just like this subgraph, it's just like this picture. If G is a finite group and H is a subgroup of G, then we have this index of, G, of H. The index of H is equals to G times, uh, well, G divides H. Okay. So you can see that then everything can be, well, related to the number theory, if you want. And let me write a remark here. If G is uh, infinite, this is actually also true, but you have to write it another way. That is, you can also divide this G into different, uh, different equivalent classes, uh, but of course, Either you have your subgroup have infinite many elements or you have infinite many, well, equivalent classes. You cannot divide G by H because they might be infinity, well, infinity divided by infinity. But you can write it this way and uh, simply say that, okay, if G is infinity, then either this term is infinity or this term is infinity or both equals to infinity. Okay. Um, I'll now prove it because you can see that from the graph. Okay. Uh, what I would like to do is I would like to, <coughs> rather than prove this Lagrange theorem, I would like to mention 
several well, stronger version of Lagrange counting theorem. Several more important thing other than that, uh, we, you may find this kind of counting theorem are important and you may use them in the future. You may use them in your homework problems, but it's not necessary, okay? This kind of counting theorem just tell you some idea about, well, about group, about equivalent classes, about cosets. Well, here is the first one that is stronger than the Lagrange theorem. If H is a subset of K, K is a subset of G, then what we have is G, the index of H on G is equal to the index of G on K times the index of K on H. Okay. So it's kind of like a um, like a translation, okay? It's kind of like the translation. It's kind of like you from G from H to G is the same as from H to K and K to H, uh, K to G. Okay, this one you can prove it by count. Well, count the equivalent classes and. Uh, then try to say that, okay, if you have equivalent classes and divide into smaller equivalent classes, then, well, the total number of equivalent classes is just that do, you do the multiplication, okay? For each one of the equivalent classes, you divide it into several. Then the total number of equivalent classes is just how many equivalent classes here and how many equivalent classes you divide on one equivalent class. Right. Oh, wait, no, wait, can I ask two questions? Of course. So first, when we're trying to prove Lagrange theorem, like mm -hmm. we show that the ghosts don't intersect, but how do we show that like all the elements are covered? That's a very good point, which is why, which is why I say that, okay, as long as you can show it is actually an equivalent relation, you are done, all right? It is an equivalent relation on G. Oh, oh, oh okay, 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 I see. Right. Uh, Any element can be written as uh, some element in H times some element which is not in H. This will always be true. And the second question is, like you said that this, like, this theory about HKG, is like mm -hmm. more powerful than Lagrange theorem, right? Mm -hmm. So how does Lagrange theorem follow from it? Let me show you. The, well, proof of uh, Lagrange from this theorem. Well, the number, the number of elements of G is actually equals to the index of, well, this trivial subset of, of G, which is E of G, right? Of course that is true, right? This, this guy is, uh, is what? The coset of uh, this, this set, this group, this subgroup is what? Is, uh, well, any element in G, you multiply this coset, you get that element as a single set single element set. Then, okay, of course, each equivalent classes, you only have one element. Then totally you have how many equivalent classes, that means how many, how many elements you have on G, right? And from this, it is actually equals to G, the index from G to H times the index from H to e, which is the index from G to H times the number of elements of H. So the Lagrange follows. Okay. That clear? Yeah. Wow, that was a nice trick. Wait, no. wait, wait, wait. 
Give me a sec. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, this is why I say this theorem is, uh, is more powerful than Lagrange. Because you can see what is the smallest subgroup of a group. It's this one. Then you divide this G by this group. Then that simply means every single element you set it as, a, as one single equivalent class. Then well done. OK. And the remark is, this theorem is also true if uh, G is infinite. Moreover, we have even, well, more complicated theorem than this one. That is, I'll just write it to you and I'll not explain too much to you because uh, um, it's not so easy to find examples about this theorem, but it's actually, again, a corollary to this one, okay? If H is a subset of G, K is a subset of G, then H intersect with K is also a subset of G. You can show it, you can show that. If H is a subset, K is a subset, then H intersect with K is also a subgroup, I mean subgroup. But be careful, H unit, K may not be a subgroup of G, okay? And uh, H times K, what's the meaning of the multiplication of two sets? What's the, what's the definition of multiplication of two sets? Well, it's the same as you, the multiplication for, for an element of the set, right? It's just the H times K for all H in H and K in K. Okay, but H times K may not be a subgroup. If H, if, uh, if G is a uh, billion, then H times K may be a subgroup. But if, H, if G is not a billion, then H times K is not a subgroup. But what we do have is, if you want to compute the number of elements of H times K as a set, it's actually equals to the index of H to H time H intersect with K and the times K, well, K with index H intersect with K times the number of H intersect with K. In particular, if H and K are both finite, then we know that a, the index from H to H, uh, H intersect with K is the number of elements of H divided by H intersect with K, right? The number, the index of this one is actually equals to K divided by H intersect with K. So if H and K are both finite group, then we have HK can be computed as H amount of element, K amount of element, divided by H intersect with K. This is more or less like this uh, counting theorem, uh, like uh, this uh, VN graph, this kind of counting theorem, right? The, uh, the number of elements of H intersect with K is equal to the number of elements of H plus the number of elements of K minus the number of the intersection of H and K, right? But here, what it tells you is, if on, on these two sets, H and K, it has a group structure. It has a group structure, then if you try to compute the multiplication of these two sets, how many elements do you have on this multiplication set? Then it's simply like the multiplication of this uh, number of these two sets divided by the intersection. Okay. So this is a very interesting theorem, but uh, you may try to find it useful, why it's useful in the future, but I will not give you any example here because, well, this can be seen as extra meat for you. You can use it without proof.
And the proof is not so hard. You can try to prove it if you want. Okay, so let's go back to the Lagrange theorem. These two guys are more complicated than the Lagrange theorem. And uh, let's go to something that is easier than Lagrange theorem and uh, uh, so that we can well solve some homework problem. Uh, let's see some corollary of Lagrange theorem. Lagrange theorem is really an interesting theorem. It just say that, okay, you can give you, if I gave you a subgroup, then you can always divide the, the whole group based on this subgroup. So this means a lot. For instance, the first thing is, uh, is something we have used on our well, midterms. That's the first step. If H is a subgroup, of a finite set of a finite group G, then the number of elements of H can divide the number of elements of G. Okay? Well, because you have this Lagrange theorem. This number multiplied by H is equal to G. This also means if H is a subset or a subgroup, and H has element more than a half G, then H is G. Right? It cannot be anything else. There's no subgroup with element between half G and G. Okay? And also, if A is in G, then the order of A divides G. Or that also say that if G is equals to N, then for any element in G, A to the power N must equals to Z. identity. Right? because the order of A divides N. So if you raise, raise A to the nth power, then you must get is equals to E. And another theorem, another corollary is, uh, well, suppose the G has only P element, P is prime. Then that means G is cyclic. Which means G can be generated by one element of it. Why is that? Because, well, for any element on G is either identity or has or has older P cannot be something else. If it has older P, then that means A to the power one, A to the power, this element to the power one, this element to the power two, and two, and this element to the power P minus one are different elements. And uh, that means it forms a whole G. Okay? So these are the direct corollary to Lagrange theorem. Any question? Before oh, does it prove a little for mm. my theorem then? Hmm? Does it prove a uh, like little for my theorem? Oh, you can. Definitely you can. You can prove the little for my theorem by this Lagrange theorem. This, is, can, this can be seen as a byproduct. And uh, well, you can see that this is also an exercise on your textbook. Is that clear? The fem little Fermat theorem can be proved by this, uh, well, this uh, Lagrange theorem. Oh, you, so you're basically just saying let G be a ZP with mm -hmm. the creation of multiplication. Mm -hmm. And we know that its order is prime. Mm -hmm. And then it's a cyclic group 
And if it's a cyclic group, means that it's gener. Well, oh, oh, yeah, kind of. So, what is later from us here? Like uh, a in the power of p minus one is uh, uh, equivalent to one modular p. Mm hmm. Ah, uh, well, let me write it somewhere. Oh yeah, we better write it as like a in the power of b is equivalent to a because it think it well it doesn't matter. Oh and because our you period want to this? Mm -hmm. because our period is b, it means that like if we multiply wait, but that's a so if you want to prove the little frame theorem by Lagrange theorem or by this corollary, for instance, right? What group you are studying? What group you are studying? ZP with the multiplication. ZP with multiplication as a group, right? How many elements do you have on this group? P. Do you have P element? You have one, you have two, you have P minus one. Do you have P here? Yeah, Do so you have order P. What is the inverse of this uh, equivalent class of P or this P element? If it is a group, it must have an inverse. Wait, but it ha should have an inverse everywhere except for for the p, right? Well, so that means this can, if you try to study the multiplication operation on zp, then you cannot include zero, right? Remember, if you if we have a ring, we want to study the multiplication of this ring as a group. Then we oh. study the non-zero element. It forms a group. Oh, okay. And then and then zero the unit. The period, and then x in the power. Right. Oh, so okay. this guy, if you try to study the marcation, you are studying a group with element p minus one. Mm. So that you have this. Be careful. You see. Be careful about the set and the operation, okay? If you try to study a group, you only have one operation, don't forget. And uh, under this one operation, it must form a group. Okay? Any other question? Sorry, can you explain again about the, the second quarry? Second corollary, this one. Right. So for this one, if you have a subgroup, if you have a subgroup H, and this subgroup has the amount of element which is greater than, well, it's more than half of G, then we know that this H must be a factor of G, right? This number of H, the number of element of H must be a factor of the number of element of G. But if you multiply two here, you already get the number of element of H is, well, times two is greater than H, it's greater than G. So that means the number of element of H must be equal to the number of element of G, right? And it's also a subgroup, which means it's a subset. So that means it must be everything. You cannot multiply something smaller than two, other than one, right? To a integer. Yeah. So can you explain again about like the number of factor of H is a factor of the number of elements of G? Yes, because we have the Lagrange theorem. 
we have the Lagrange theorem. The number of uh, the number of h, the number of element of h times the index of h is equals to the number of g. The index of h, of course, is always an integer. Okay, got it. Thank you. This is why, well, this is why magic always happen, right? Any other question? Let me write a remark here, okay? So this is a very important thing you have to keep in mind. The converse of Lagrange is false. What is the converse of Lagrange? Let's simply say that, okay, if, if for instance, you have a group of order, say, P times Q. Uh, say you have a group of order uh, 16, for instance. Two is a factor of 16. But there may no, there may be no subgroup with uh, well with order two. Okay. For instance, on Z2, well, the Z2 might not be a good example. Uh, um, Z4, Z4 is equals to, well, with, uh, with uh, modification, uh, with addition, it is one, two, three, and zero. It has four elements. I'm sorry, Z4 has this kind of structure. Uh, but anyway, what I want to say is, you will see that in, in a moment, okay? What I want to say is, if you have a group, and this group has, uh, has order, for instance, six, then it may not, it may have, a, it may have a, well, an element of order three but it may not have an element of order three as well, okay? It may not have a subgroup of order three as well. So this is not one-to-one -one correspondence. The factor of the number of elements of group is not one-to-one uh, -one corresponding to the, well, the number of elements of, uh, of a subgroup, okay? We can only say that this guy must be a factor. But that doesn't mean any factor you gave me, I can find a subgroup. Okay, we'll see that very soon. And uh, last thing I want to do today is a theorem. This theorem, it uses the Lagrange theorem and uh, you can see from this theorem about what those uh, mathematicians who study group theory I already do. They try to, what they try to do is they try to find all the well small small numbers finite uh, finite groups what kind of group you can you can have okay so let g be a group of order less or equal than seven then g can only have three situations there are only finitely many kind of uh, group that has order less or equal than seven, and we can list them here, all of them, okay? If n equals to two, three, five, and seven, we know that then G is cyclic. And second, if n equals to four, the fourth order group, well, what can you imagine that the fourth order groups looks like? I would say G is uh, isomorphic to, you only have two kinds of uh, fourth order group, okay? To either Z4 under addition 
or the so-called V, the so-called uh, Klein for group. I'll tell you what is that, okay? And third, we discuss the group of order two, three, four, five, and seven. The last thing we meant is about n equals to six. If n equals to six, then G is isomorphic to either Z6, if G is a billion, or the symmetric group of our triangle, or as we mentioned before, S3, if G is non-abelian. Okay, so which means, well, whatever group you have, as long as it's older, as long as you tell me the older, the older is very small, it's less or equal than seven, then as long as you tell me the older, I can tell you what group it might be. You only have only very small, well, uh, opportunities or cases that you want to discuss, okay? This is for the group of order less or equal than seven. What if you have a group of order eight or nine or 10 or 12? Well, the situation becomes much, much, much more complicated. You may need a much longer proof than what I'm going to show you about well, what kind of group you have. To do a classification of groups, among isomorphism, do a classification of groups. It's always uh, where one of the key problems in the field of abstract algebra. And uh, one of the biggest achievements on last century, or maybe uh, even until this century, is until, until 2004. Those mathematicians are able to do a complete classification of so-called the simple group, actually finite simple group. Wait, what, is what, is, what is a simple group? I didn't tell you that, right? Uh, well, it depends on time. If we have enough time, I can tell you the definition of simple group. But from the name, you can see that simple group is, must be very simple, right? However, even, it, even if it is a very simple, even if it is so-called a simple group, well, until the classification of all the finite simple group is done until 2004. And uh, well, the total amount of papers that do this classification, um, I think is more than, uh, probably more than, more than 20 papers about that. And the total length of the classification, the total classification of the finite simple group, I think is more than 1,000 pages. Yeah, it's very complicated. And uh, it's, a, it's a very big achievement. That has been that has been done by mathematicians. Oh, oh, is that something connected to like those monster groups? With, with exactly, you you got it. Yeah, I think the monster group is uh, one of uh, one of very typical simple group, one class of very typical simple group, and there are a lot of other kind of simple groups. And uh, the hardest part is sometimes you have some kind of simple group which is like a singleton, and uh, it is uh, by itself. And you have to study it by itself, just like this client for group or this kind of S3 group. It's slightly different from some other groups, right? But we don't, we will not, we will not say, uh, say too much about it because uh, the proof is uh, is not readable, at least not readable for me. 
and uh, it's super, super long. It's very, very complicated. It's very, well, I have to say, kind of recent uh, result. And it lasts a very long in, until you prove it, until the mathematicians prove it. Okay, so you can see that the classification of groups is a very hard topic. Now, what we can do here is just, uh, okay, I can do a classification of groups of, uh, of order less or equal than seven. It seems that we don't have time today, so I'll postpone the proof of this theorem on Thursday. And uh, uh, another remark about this theorem is, you may see that, uh, well, by the way, let me tell you, since I have four minutes left, let me tell you what is a client four group. A client four group is uh, it more or less like the contouring, uh, the contouring group, that is, you have a group with uh, the Klein four group is a very well famous group because it only has four elements. It has this structure. It's like E, I, J, and K, such that every element are of order either one or two. Well, E is identity, I squared equals to E, J squared equals to E, K squared equals to E. Okay, it's just like, well, in the contorium, you have plus or minus one, plus or minus I, plus or minus J, plus or minus K. And uh, I squared equals to J squared equals to I, K squared equals to minus one. But here, this kind four, four group is just uh, you make plus or minus one the same, okay? So that I square equals to E, J square equals to E, and K square equals to E. Moreover, I times J equals to J times I equals to K. You multiply two of them, you get the third one. Oh, K so it's Klein? K hmm? It's what? So Klein four group is just the same as quaternions or quaternions? It's, uh, it's more or less like the quaternion, but uh, the the biggest difference is the quaternion is not a, a building group, right? If you if you try to look at the multiplication group of this quaternion, quaternion set, then it's not a building. But this Klein four group is something that you make it nicer so that everything becomes pretty nice and it's a building group. And k times i and j times k is equals to k times j is equals to i. Okay, so it is an abelian group and it has four element and it's not Z4 because every element on this group has order two. But on Z4, you have element of order four, okay? So that's, that's also why I say that as a converse of uh, of this, uh, well, of this Lagrange theorem is not true because four is a factor of four, but on this group, you don't have any element of order four. Okay. This is a Klein four group. And uh, you can see that as long as I gave you this Klein four group, you can see all the groups of order less or equal than five are a billion. Right? This is um, actually a coincidence or maybe a byproduct of this theorem. And uh, the smallest uh, non abelian group or the, the, the group with the smallest element that is non abelian is this one, S3 or the symmetric group of this uh, triangle, of this equivalent triangle. Okay, so I'll prove it on Thursday. Uh, I will end here, and uh, again, I will have office hour uh, for from from now to three. Okay, so well, before I stop the re stop stop the recording, uh, any question?
Oh, oh, uh, I don't know. But like, so is that thing uh, that, say, for example, uh, Z6 can be either a billion or S3, is that some kind of related to like, how do we classify the finite graphs? Like, in a sense, uh, when we, uh, wait, I forgot the formulation, but there are a lot of like different terms about how you classify graphs. And there, you kind of This show might be true. Yeah, you are right. This might be true. When you're trying to do the classification of graphs, you may try to find some, well, group structure on graphs. But, uh, well, I'm not quite familiar with this area. I'm sorry about that. You may, you may try to ask Italos. Uh, he, 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 he should be an expert in this area. So maybe he will know, well, whether how you can connect it the group structure with the graph. Yes, uh, that is possible, I think. I'm not pretty sure, sorry about that. Oh, but that would be interesting. Oh, also mm, guys, can you see during the Pi Day? Because it's in 11 days. Oh, uh, okay, if, you, if we talk about the Pi Day, then that's, uh, well, that's end the record, okay? Any other question? Okay, then I will end the record.